Hi everybody, welcome back. Well, judging by that little survey video I did, the Fisher overwhelmingly won uh, that survey. So we're going to do the Fisher, which is going to be a pretty daunting task. And I want to assure all of you that I am definitely going to do those other two Pioneer receivers as well, along with a whole bunch of other things I have. I have a turntable I want to get to. I have a uh, complete three-component SAE uh, integrated amp tuner and tape deck that I want to redo. Uh, I have a really nice tuner that I want to go over and of course those two receivers plus another preamp, a really cool one. So lots of things coming up. But this one's going to be the Fisher. This is going to be a long video, this first part, because I have a lot of things that I want to cover and it's not really going to be easy to break it up. The other reason for the longer videos is it's easier for me to, to string out one video, do one upload, one editing, get it up there, and then let you guys you know, come back to it. Watch part of it, come back, pick up where you left off. You can do that. It's a little bit inconvenient for you, but it's so much easier for me than to try to break up different videos, edit them, and then upload them separately, name them separately. That's a lot of extra work for me that I just don't have time to do. So that's why this one's probably going to be long. Uh, I hope you enjoy it. There's a lot of good information in here. I've learned a lot of good things and uh, I think this is going to be a really fun project. So without any further ado, off with the video. Let's start. Hi everybody. Well, the people have spoken. <laughs> I put up that little short, that was the first one I ever did, and uh, overwhelmingly everybody requested that we do the Fisher Model 800B receiver. So we're going to do that. Now this is going to be a very, very interesting project for many reasons. Um, we've done Fisher and Scott receivers from this era and uh, you know in past videos but uh, this one I think is going to be a little bit more interesting at least to me it is in case you're not familiar with these they're a little bit different than your standard even vacuum tube style receiver if you notice on the AM there's one dial on this side and then there's a separate tuning dial and scale on the left side for the FM and if you go back and watch my Scott 399 receiver series it had a similar layout to this and the reason for that was when these came out around 1961 they were experimenting with stereo uh, broadcasting stereo over the air and they they had not perfected the multiplex circuit yet and we'll get more into that in a minute and for a little while they were doing uh, uh, something that they referred to as binaural audio. And essentially what they would do is they would transmit the left channel on an FM station and the right channel on an AM station and you would tune them in and you would play the AM received station on one, one channel of your stereo amplifier and the FM on the other channel. And we demonstrated this on the Scott 399. I'm not going to probably do that again on this video because I already went through and did a setup where I had two signal generators and I modulated them with audio from left and right channel. And it tuned in, it worked perfectly. So this thing was capable of doing that, but beyond that, it also had the feature built into it of the new multiplex FM stereo demodulator which is this little module right up here. So if you look here, this little separate sub-chassis that's mounted here with these couple of screws, that's actually the thing that decodes the FM stereo. We'll get into that. And it, you can actually remove this altogether and the unit will still work, it just won't be able to receive in stereo. So all, all of the functions of this knob in the middle <laughs> deal with that. So if you notice, not only can you select you know, your tape deck, your phono, but then you have your multiplex stereo, 
FM mono, FM AM stereo, which is that binaural, where you would tune one channel on AM and one on FM for your stereo. Then you just have straight AM, which means it'll play the AM tuner in mono through both channels, right and left. And then your auxiliary and tape inputs here. Now there's a difference between tape head and tape. <laughs> tape head, much like the phono stage, will have a de-emphasis circuit and have much higher gain. Whereas the tape over here is for a tape deck that has a built-in preamp, much like uh, you know all your other auxiliary <laughs> inputs would be, like a tuner or something that's external. So that's what these are for. And of course you have all the, the typical the low cut filter, you know, for the for the rumble and the high cut filter over here, uh, you know, for the scratch filter they call it, bass and treble, and there, these are dual pots so you can adjust the bass and treble for the right and left channels independently, and that was important when you were using that binaural audio because the FM and AM could have different fidelity. So you could adjust the tone controls to try to make it balance out. It was really a janky setup, but it worked. And they didn't do it for very long, and there weren't very many stations that actually did it, or many programs broadcast in that. There's actually a broad and sharp AM bandwidth adjustment, so the tuners in these were actually really good. We're going to see that. Loudness switch, and of course your balance and volume. And the thing has a couple of the little magic eye tubes for your tuning indicator. And there's one on each channel. And I'm pretty sure we had the same thing uh, on that Scott 399. A lot of similarities there. Uh, what is a lot different, though, is the, the design of the amplifier section. Now, this amplifier, uh, I, it, when it showed up, it came like this. And uh, the, the nuts were missing for holding the faceplate on, and the faceplate was shipped separately, was wrapped up in bubble wrap. It is missing the knobs. They did not have knobs with it, but we're going to 3D print some with a resin printer. And we're, we're going to get some remanufactured of the brass brights, which are the little brass caps for the end of the knob. So we'll see how that looks. And... Uh, I did take the bottom off. There were no screws holding the bottom cover, and we're going to look at this in a minute, but uh, I did notice that they had modified this very slightly. Now, it's not the modification that, you know, that's very commonly spoken about. All they did was they, they took the cathodes of the output tubes and they floated them with a 10 ohm resistor so you could measure the, the bias individually on these. And what we're going to find out in this amplifier that one of the flaws of the design of this and many of the Fisher amplifiers is in order for them to work at their peak performance, you have to have an apex matched set of tubes. They have to be almost bogey matched, like perfect, uh, for these to operate correctly. The same thing with the driver and phase inverter stage. You can't just put any tube in there or it affects the performance of the amp because you don't have, you only have one adjustment for each channel and that's the, this phase inverter adjustment. We'll talk about that throughout the video as well. So this is an interesting receiver all around and there are some mods that are not done to this that we're going to do. And uh, there's other things like capacitors aren't a big thing in these receivers. Most of the caps that are in here are film caps. They're not paper and foil and wax. Uh, they're the early version, and usually those, those coupling caps are good. The big electrolytics, there's quite a few of them. You can buy an entire set from Hayseed Hamfest. You can also make your own. You can restuff these. You can also get the CE uh, uh, Enterprises or whatever, the old Sprague company, whatever they are, uh, you, you can order those and get ones that generally have the same values as these that you could mix and match. Uh, so we have options for that. And uh, I don't know if we'll need to, but I did see the one of these caps looked like it was starting to leak a little bit physically. 
so probably we're going to want to replace them and uh, looking at the tubes on the top see this brown stuff on here these tubes have been severely overheated and damaged so they're probably they're no good we won't be able to use them and one was even replaced again why does this happen well it's probably because the bias wasn't correct for these tubes and you can't there is no bias adjustment in there that's one of the flaws of these amplifiers however when these are properly modified and repaired and restored they are very high performance they sound really good and uh, they they are held in very high regards matter of fact one of my favorite amplifiers I have one if you go back I have a model X 101 C integrated amplifier based on the same principle as this but they did some modifications uh, to the circuit that makes it a little different than this even though they're made around the same year uh, it actually <laughs> worked a little better than these ones did although I did have to make some changes to it as well um, and you can go back and watch that series if you want so anyway enough talking let's flip this thing over and we'll look underneath all right I am just barely in frame I think here without having to go to my wide-angle lens which is good and as I said when this showed up it did not have any of the screws I think this was a project amplifier of somebody who of the person that sold it and they had begun restoration on it because I can see that the faceplate was excellent you could tell from that the chassis is pretty clean the the dial glass is really good it looks like the, some of the controls had been cleaned and possibly deoxed or whatever. Uh, you, you can see generally the covers in nice shape. There's not any really bad pitting or anything in there. And when and there is a, a dent here and a little dent here, but we can fix that. But this just lifts right off. And when you get inside, it's mostly untouched. So the only couple of things that looked to be replaced in here was of course we have this capacitor here and we'll have to see what that is and it's a high quality Sprague Atom capacitor so I'm not gonna have to mess with that it was very well installed the soldering here was excellent you can see these teeny tiny and I will zoom you in so you can see them uh, And like I said, whoever did this knew what they were doing. I mean, because they did all the tricks. So pin 5 on these 7591 output tubes is your cathode. So that would normally go, that goes to ground. And normally on the circuit, and we'll look at the schematic later, this would be tied directly to ground. But if you notice, these tiny little quarter watt re 10 ohm resistors were put in here. Now, why are they using such tiny little resistors? Well, these are what we would refer to as fusible resistors. They're put in there for the reason that if the tube overloads, if it draws excessive current or if there's a short, this resistor will burn open. It will fail. It's designed to fail. In other words, you don't want a big heavy duty resistor in here. You want it to fail and open up, which would cut the, the current draw from the, uh, from the vacuum tube. If you have, you know, something goes wrong where it's, the tube starts drawing excessive current, better to replace a resistor than an expensive 7591. So he put those in there. The other advantage is you can put your voltmeter across here, measure the voltage drop, do the math, and you can determine what the cathode current is of the tube uh, and see what the bias looks like so you can see if they're balanced and so forth so good little thing to do to uh, an amplifier so that was good and you can see these caps here the coupling caps you know they're probably perfect I doubt that they're leaky we'll, we'll measure them but really there's not there aren't very many components in here that fail and that's why a lot of these Fisher amps you know 60 70 years later <laughs> you can plug them in turn them on and as long as the, the filter caps are good it'll fire right up and play I mean it may not play like it did when it was brand new 
but the amplifier will, will work. And uh, just looking, here's the first filter cap that you come to uh, when you come out of the power supply. But we'll, again, we'll get to the schematics here in a little bit. And if you see, there's two diodes and they're kind of connected funny. And the reason for this is this is not your traditional power supply. This actually uses a voltage doubler circuit. And I get into why uh, Fisher did that. It was a very unique design and actually it's advantageous. You would think that only having a half wave, uh, a half cycle charging up the capacitor, it would be noisier, but the way they wind these power transformers is they're special transformers. They have very low impedance outputs, so they can actually, their impulse current can be very high. They can deliver high amounts of current. So the way this thing works, it's actually better than a split power supply that has, you know, a center tap and, and two diodes and, you know, the traditional uh, full, full, full wave rectifier. And if you look down here, the, when you see this tar starting to squish out from the holes, it means that the capacitor is probably going high ESR or, or becoming leaky, one or the other. And that heat is heating up the capacitor and melting that tar inside the cap and it's squishing out through here. If you compare that to the capacitors next to it, that tar is not squishing out of those. So I think this thing will need new filters in it. And that's fine, we can do that. That's easy, we can, they're, they're not cheap. <laughs> but I think this one is a good enough candidate that I would, I would say that it's worth spending the money. And you are going to spend uh, probably about $150 or so uh, on capacitors, regardless of where you get them from or what options you use. Uh, unless you want to just get a couple of loose capacitors and just kind of tack them out here on strips or something. But if you want the ones that are in the cans that, that will fit in place, expect to spend some pretty good money on it. But again, to me, it's going to be worth it, so I'm going to do it. All right, let's uh, look at some schematics. And by the way, you have an electrolytic here, which looks like it has leaked one here and one here, and those are your electrolytics. That's it. So a recap on these is very easy. There's really not much to do. For the bias circuit, we have one of these little selenium bridge rectifiers down in there, and we may replace that also and put a more modern component in there. And we may make a little change to the bias circuit as well. I haven't decided if we're gonna need that or not. We're going to need new new output tubes, so we're going to replace those with an apex matched quad, so they're all equal. And yeah, they can't be two matched pairs. They actually have to be a matched quad. They all have to be the same because there's one master power supply for the entire bias circuit, and it's non-adjustable. And the, everything is preset on these. And it really, it was designed for matched tubes. And of course, back then, Fisher and Scott and all these companies had no problems getting high quality matched tubes like that, because that was, that was the era. Today, you have to make sure you order them. That's an added expense. And you even have to get ones that are the same characteristics as the tubes when, the, when they designed these. A lot of times they may have the same name, you know, the 7591, but there may be some slight differences where it, it won't work the same. So we have our work cut out for us on this one. It's not, again, it's not going to be a lot of physical work. It's going to be mental work, making sure we make the right changes to this in the right way. And in the end, I think this is going to be a real performer. So I'm really excited about this. Let's get started with the schematic now. On this video series, I think I'm going to do things a little bit different than other times. We're going to do a lot of 
thinking and a lot of what if. We're going to do some experimenting and we're going to try to go through the circuit and understand it on a deeper level than just repairing an amplifier and recapping things and so forth. That may be appealing to some of you who are interested in working with this or people that are just interested in, in learning more about it, but others not so much. I know I got a lot of new uh, subscribers lately and so some of you may not be familiar with the format that I use sometimes, but a lot of times I go through and try to explain things and it frustrates a lot of people. Some people will say, you know, just get on with it. You're talking too much or um, just tell me what to replace. T tell me how to replace the capacitor so it'll work again when it breaks. Well, I'm not one of those types. This, that's not the purpose of this channel and that's not why I started sharing online. I'm a firm believer that I would rather learn how to fish than have somebody just hand me a fish. That's an old saying, right? Uh, I would, you know, better to, to, if you give a man a fish, he eats for a day, but if you teach him how to fish, he eats for a lifetime. And uh, that's pretty much the principle that, that I like to follow with this channel. Another big comment that I get, why do you work with old technology? You know, there's all these fancy new digital and people start giving, putting all these acronym letters that stand for different kinds of new stuff that's out. But I would counter that by saying it's, it's very difficult to learn how to run <laughs> until you've learned how to effectively, how to crawl and how to walk. And Let's just look at an example here. Here's a chip. This is not a transistor. It looks like it is, but it's not. It's an integrated circuit. There are 10 transistors and a myriad of resistors and capacitors inside this chip. And this chip takes the function of this whole section of this amplifier. Uh, if you look inside here, This is an equivalent circuit. That means that's not what's inside this, but this is the function that it's performing. And if we look at an example of how you could use this, right there is an AM radio. <laughs> now it's only got a sensitivity of about 600 microvolts, so it's not a real sensitive radio nor is it very selective because it doesn't have an intermediate frequency in it. And we're not going to talk about all those things. I did that in so many other videos. But with six or seven compo external components, this little chip can be a fully working AM broadcast receiving radio. And I've built radios with these and they work. The problem is it's really hard for me to show you something to take my oscilloscope and poke around inside there because it's all in this chip. And unfortunately, a lot of people learn beginning with this type of technology. I mean, there's FM radio chips as well that are, you know, that do have the multiplex and the, the, the discriminator and the, the IF and everything on one chip. Uh, this is a very simple one and it's a tuned radio tuned radio frequency. It kind of works like a TRF receiver, but it works. The point that I'm making is it's very difficult to get your mind wrapped around how the concept of electronics works when you're looking at the micro world of chips and things like that, regardless of if it's radio or anything else. Another thing is, you know, what's the per why do we care about this? AM and FM are, are, are dying or in some countries already dead. So why would you bother learning this? Well, I hate to burst your bubble, <laughs> but the concept of how a carrier signal is received is still mostly unchanged from day one. Yes, the modulation that you're uh, placing onto that carrier signal can be very different. There are different modes, digital modes and analog modes, but all of those are just modulation 
things that you're doing. But the way that, that an electromagnetic signal propagates through the air, the way that you receive it uh, from the environment, is still pretty much unchanged. In other words, we can't really change the laws of physics, right? And yeah, instead of a coil and capacitor tank circuit at the beginning, we can use, you know, varactor diodes and, and different methods like that. And we can call some of that digital if we like. But the truth of the matter is, a lot of this, the concept that goes behind all the new modern technology is the same concept on which this was based. So when this is so much easier to look at, what's it easier for me to show you the sections of a, of a receiver? This chip that I can just say, here's a chip, or to actually show you at the beginning where you have a coil and a variable capacitor that you're going to be able to tune that carrier frequency and then how that frequency goes through an RF stage and gets amplified and then converted into an intermediate frequency and then filtered and then reamplified, then detected, then amplified again, then passed through the, to the audio amplifier and through the preamp, the output stage into your speaker and into your ear. It's all here. I can show it to you. And more importantly, I can show it to myself. I can learn from that. And that's why to me, I, even if AM and FM radio and analog audio became a complete dinosaur that no longer existed, I would still work with it. I would still work with these circuits and I would still restore old radios to learn about them because really that's where you get the foundation of how this is going to work down the road. And so that's why I do things the way I do. And that's why I believe this is still very relevant beyond just the historical value and how much it fascinates me that there were people back 70, 80, 90, 100 years ago that were able to figure this out with a lot less resources than we have today. They didn't have an internet to just log on to and click on something and skip through to the one little section they care about and look it up and just take advantage of that and don't worry how it happened just follow it and blindly follow it and do it no they had to actually sit down and go through things they had to attend classes they had to read a lot of books and a lot of materials from other people they had to do a lot of experimenting on the bench uh, quite often not knowing what was going to happen they had to use a lot of mathematics rather than trying to use it, you know, modeling software or simulation software on a computer. They had to draw a schematic and then build it out and test it to see what happens. So it fascinates me that those kinds of brilliant minds existed and what all they did for us so that we could be where we are today. So I hope that little monologue there helps you to understand why I do these videos the way that I do. And with that in mind, that explains what we're going to do with this video, with this whole series. I've done a lot of tube amplifiers, and it's funny, I had a comment from somebody that said, this is your first tube amp, I'd like to see you do the Fisher. <laughs> but go back through my, through my past videos, there's two or three hundred of them now and uh, just not too long ago I did the Scott 399 which is very similar concept to this one and I've done other Fisher receivers and amplifiers and I did a Macintosh tuner and I've done you know all kinds of vacuum tube projects I did I designed a, a vacuum tube amp I built a kit vacuum tube amp so lots of vacuum tubes <laughs> but uh, I just really like the solid state stuff as well. I like it all. It's, it's fascinating. All right, let's get to the task at hand here. Okay, for starters, we're gonna start with looking at the amplifier section of this. We'll deal with the tuner in a later, later video in this series. But really, I wanna make sure that all of our power supplies and our amplifier section are working properly because those are all the high-powered things. The tuner always, 
is going to if it may have a few problems with you know with an IF transformer coil or something but by and large we can always get that working it's usually uh, a little bit <laughs> less likely that something will really seriously fail because they're lower power wherever you have a lot of power being dissipated that's where you're going to have problems and those output tubes if you remember were pretty badly damaged and it tells me that something's wrong I mean looking at this tube you see how that's that brown color that's not good and all of them are like that so we're going to focus first on the amplifier okay I stepped away from this project for a little while for some other you know personal things at home and at work and everything uh, so I forget where I left off on the schematics so I'm going to do this part here and it may be redundant and I'll edit out the other part or whatever but we're looking at the amplifier section first as I said before and this is an interesting circuit and we'll go through it a little bit now first of all when you look at this right here it can be kind of confusing because you see all these resistors stacked up here and you're saying to yourself what's going on here and whenever I can't get my mind wrapped around a schematic like this sometimes it helps to redraw them in a more common fashion to make it more understandable to your own mind I'll show you what I mean by that Now this section right here kind of confused me a little bit looking at what they were doing but after redrawing it it makes a little more sense so let me zoom you in a little closer on what's happening okay so really when you look at it redrawn all the circuits are the same I just kind of moved moved the components around to make more sense of them and really all you have here is a very traditional drive circuit out of an amplifier and this is a really common circuit that you'll see in a lot of the EL84 or 6BQ5 amplifiers this is a great design because it's pretty simple and if you don't need a whole lot of gain on the stage because of course this section we'll talk about it in a minute doesn't have gain in it really this is a good circuit now if you were going to drive some big tubes some like the KT88s or something that need no wait a minute KT88s are pretty sensitive some of the tubes that require a lot higher amplitude of drive signal into the grids this probably won't do it because you need you need an extra set of drivers in between there uh, but that being said this works really well for this circuit but there's a few things that Fisher has done in this amp and it carries over into a lot of their other uh, amplifiers from this era and the one thing you see often is first of all all this is when it's redrawn is a cathodyne phase inverter or phase splitter and this is your voltage amplifier section very common when you look at it this way it, it's not really obvious because of the way they drew this feedback circuit in here underneath it makes it look like this is your ground and in a way it is we'll get into that in a minute but it's a lot easier when you look at it this way you have these two sections right now that are sharing a common uh, resistor for the ground from cathode and then you have these resistors in here and you're injecting your global negative feedback into both of these elements here so that's a little bit different the other thing that they do is they they put this resistor and it goes straight from your B plus to your cathode so it's kind of strange that you have B plus going into your anode and B plus going into your cathode and you can see this is a higher resistance than this side but you're feeding DC in here now there's a few reasons for doing this as why they do it 
Number one, it has to do with the biasing of the circuit itself. I've read some articles or some forums where people will say they just removed this and it sounded better. But I can assure you, and hopefully I get some video of this, if you pull this out, it will not work. It, it throws all this off. You have to modify more than just removing this. The other more ominous reason why you would never want to re remove this as it sits is this is what's called a direct or DC coupled stage. In other words, the DC voltage, so it's DC has dual meanings in this one. It all it means direct coupled because there's no capacitor coupling, but it also is DC coupled. In other words, there is a DC level feeding from this tube to this tube on the grid. And you can see right here, here's your 320 volts. Your, when this bias is, when this tube heats up, it's going to sit at about 270, 280 volts, something like that. And that 200 and something volts is applied directly to the grid of the next tube. Now you might say to yourself, positive voltage on the grid is terrible. Well, here's the thing. It's, the tube only sees it as positive grid voltage if the grid becomes higher voltage, more positive than the cathode. But really, because of this bypass right here, it's not. Okay, So you're going to find that this is actually a couple of volts lower than what the cathode sits at. And remember, this is a cathodyne. What that means is that this is not a normal cathode follower. It's not a normal anode, uh, common cathode amplifier. It is designed to have equal and opposite signals on either side. And this tube is kind of floating in between that voltage. So you can see there's a voltage divider between here and here. Now, why am I saying all this? <laughs> Well, when the tube warms up, all this kind of works out. It all balances. But when I first turn this on, if you recall, this amplifier has a solid state power supply in it. There is no vacuum tube rectifier. It uses solid state diodes for the rectifier. So as soon as I turn that power switch on, there is immediately 320 volts or more at this point. Now, what does that do? Well, if you have 320 volts here, this tube is not conducting because it's not warmed up yet. All of that 320 volts, this resistor, is, since it's, high, it's a high impedance circuit, this resistor is just like it's not even there. And all of that 320 volts goes right onto the grid. Now that in and of itself isn't a problem, but you have to remember that this cathode is tied to ground. It goes through this 68K resistor, it goes through this 220 ohm and straight to ground, and it also goes through this 3.9K resistor through the output transformer coil and to ground. So you have basically since it's high impedance again, there's no, this tube is not conducting yet, this is for all intents and purposes ground and this is for all intents and purposes 320 volts. The problem is you can't apply a high voltage difference between the cathode and the grid. That will damage the tube. It can damage it in short order. So if this resistor were not there, as soon as you turn it on, you would have a big differential of voltage between the grid and the cathode. And in, in eventually, possibly even in short order, it would damage your 12AX7 tube. Now, as it is, they, when you turn the power on here, you have one path of the voltage going here, and then you have this 150K putting the 320 volts down here, and, at, and your voltage differential is not that high then. It's maybe tens of volts instead of hundreds of volts, and that does not hurt this. So this is kind of like a protection circuit when it comes up, and then once everything starts to conduct, this also acts as a type of a, of a bypass. You're bypassing some of the signal past this tube. 
it's a very complicated design and it's not the easiest thing to mathematically figure out what they're doing. Fisher really must have done a lot of research to do this. And the whole thing of this is it, they can now adjust this up here and they can fine tune this tube for minimum distortion. It works. Now in my X101C, and I did a video on that, it has a very similar circuit to this but they change these values. This is different, some of these things are different and you still get the benefit of you know what, what I just talked about but this has less influence on the output of this which is a good thing as we will see. We're going to look at these signals and see why I'm not real crazy over this. So let's think of a way that we can modify this to get rid of this problem here, this bypass thing, and to clean up the signal because when you see what the signal looks like before and after I think you'll understand why it's advantageous to modify this circuit. And I know people have done that and there's different versions that people have done. I kind of went with my own version and uh, or I'm going to go with my own version I should say and uh, I'll show you what I drew up and then we're going to actually build it on one of the channels and then we'll compare the right to the modified versus the original circuit. Okay here's what we've come up with. I've got the original circuit up here so we can do some comparison and as you can see gone is the 150k bypass resistor and we've changed the design of the phase splitter of this cathodyne to be a more traditional circuit. In other words, we have the balanced resistors 100K on the anode and 100K on the cathode. Now, here's the problem. When we do this, even with this little grid stopper I put in here, don't worry about that, we are going to have the same problem we are going to have this that's going to be high impedance but it's going to look like a ground here because the tube is not conducting and you're gonna have a high voltage right here so this is a little more elegant way to deal with it and it's called a arc protection circuit and all it consists of is a this little 47k resistor just has to be a high enough resistance. This is what's going to kind of set how wide of a gap you're allowing it to go off the leash. And a, a diode, a steering diode. So essentially what's going to happen is you're going to, when this thing first turns on, this is not conducting. We're then going to take this voltage right here and this is going to come up immediately like we said earlier to that 320 volts. But then it is also going to pass through here. Again, this is all super high impedance. So it's going to pass through here and it's going to put this somewhere near 320 volts at the top of this 100, 100K. So the voltage difference between here is only going to be a small amount. However, when everything starts to conduct, this resistor will ensure that it doesn't interfere. The other thing is this diode prevents any voltage from here from reflecting back into here and being seen. So it does the job of keeping these in a reasonable distance from one another without actually interfering with it once the circuit is energized and you apply a signal to it. Now this grid stopper, I just used an arbitrary 1K. Uh, we may be able to get away without it or we may be able to put a bigger one in there but I'm going to start with this and, and try and see uh, if that works. I think that's going to help us out a little bit. The 470K as you notice I moved it up from a 390K and this is going to go down to 470 ohms and all of this has to do with we need to have when this is all said and done once everything is warmed up, once these two tubes are conducting and sitting at idle, 
the idea is whatever voltage, and I don't know what it's going to be yet, right? We, hopefully it'll be half, you know. <laughs> whatever this voltage turns out to be, we want this to be a couple of volts lower, or at least one volt lower. And that's going to make sure that the tube is turned off, it's not conducting. The closer we get to these being equal or this going positive, the more we're going to, the harder we're going to turn on the tube and the more it's going to conduct. So the name of the game is to get this to be a little bit lower voltage than this. So for instance, if this comes up to 90 volts, I would want this one to be sitting at about 89 volts or 88 volts, something like that. We're just using some arbitrary, and if you look, uh, let's see, if we take the schematic from the original and look, it does have the voltages, notice they're talking about 139.5 volts here and 138 volts here. So you can see it's 1.5 volts lower than the cathode. So the grid has always got to be a little bit below, and it doesn't have to be much. If it goes much more than that, it's going to affect the signal. If it approaches zero or goes above zero volts, it's going to affect the signal. <laughs> so you, you have to make sure that these voltages here make that take place. And that's going to be controlled mostly by this and this, what, what combination you use. And if you remember, I put a little note on here because we may have to modify this. Even as it is, we may have to modify it. But if not, uh, even if we get it to work, you have to remember we still don't have the output tubes or we haven't set up the outputs yet. And if you take this, I mean, let's draw something on here so you can see what I'm talking about. This is going to the secondary like that of the output transformer. This is the 16 ohm tap. So essentially this is only low ohms. Okay, it's low, low impedance. And until there's a signal on here, in the DC world, this, whatever this becomes, this is going to be shunted through here in parallel with this. So this resistance, whatever it is added to whatever this low resistance is, is going to be paralleled to this. So we really don't have 470 ohms here. We have 470 in parallel with this. And then as the signal starts, so we drive a signal into the amplifier, this is going to go up to a certain amplitude of, of voltage, of course, and that voltage is going to go back and feed back into here and it's going to change the voltage up here. That's what negative feedback is, right? So it's going to oppose this, which obviously is going to cause us to, to lose a little bit of power, or a little gain from this, but it's also going to reduce the distortion and it's going to smooth out the sound. So this is a really important thing. There, You typically will see a capacitor in parallel with this resistor and this is going to be like a filter network so that at higher frequencies you get a little bit harder feedback. This is going to reduce the uh, the possibility of the thing oscillating if you get some kind of a strange speaker load you know like crossovers and capacitors and things and it's also going to cause it to roll off after the audible frequency range so like at 30 kilohertz, 20 kilohertz, whatever we set it for, it'll start rolling off that signal because it's going to feed back harder and harder. So this is an important thing too, and a lot of people overlook this in the feedback circuit, but it's really important. And it's funny that you only have one, two, three, four components here. It is amazing how much interaction they have and how difficult it can be to determine what these are. And I, there is math that you can do and you can calculate a lot of things. I've never had luck with it. I've, I've, you can get close, but it really you need to experiment a little bit and uh, in the real world. So that's what we're gonna do when we get to that point. Let's build this up on one of the channels. And then the other channel, we're gonna leave 
the stock like this and we'll compare them. The amp's up on the bench and I've removed the output tubes. And we can do this on this particular type of circuit because it's an isolated circuit. In other words, we have these capacitors that isolate one, one side of, of this one stage from the next. And so, as a result, this stage can still function even though these are out. Now, this is one tube with two elements in it. You know, there's two tubes in one envelope, I should say. But, if these were separate tubes, you could not remove one and have the other one work right because of this direct coupling right here. It, one stage relies on the other. But anytime you have capacitor decoupling like that, we can get away with what we're going to do, which is removing these. Does that make sense? Now what will change is these guys draw the heavy current of the amplifier. And this power supply relies on that current draw to regulate. So what's going to happen is these voltages are going to float up. They're going to be higher than they normally would because there's no current being drawn by these. As long as we know that, we don't have to worry about it. And what I'm going to do is, I don't know how long it's been since this amp has been powered up. So I'm going to use a current limiting device of some sort to bring it up slowly. Now there's a couple ways we can do it. We can put, put it on the light bulb limiter, where we're just putting a light bulb filament in line with the AC mains. Or, <clears throat> you see this and you don't see me use it all the time, but we can also use our Variac. And I think that's what I'm going to do in this instance. I'm going to use the Variac, and I think that's going to be a little bit better. So we'll turn it way down. You know, we'll go like, you know, 40, 50 volts, something like that. Low voltage and plug it in and then we're going to just see uh, if this thing comes up. And the reason I'm going to do that is if one of these CAN capacitors, for instance the one that we saw the leakage on earlier, is going to short or is getting near shorting or is developing uh, leakage, then that current limit is going to prevent everything from burning up and you'll see excessive current being drawn on our little current meter which is you can see down there in the background we can watch that and see what kind of current we're drawing all right let's get started let's flip this over and uh, connect it up okay here's the scenario the meter is connected and we are looking at the high voltage and we're looking at the first stage of the high voltage, meaning we have our meter connected between ground and the first 395 volts. Okay, so we should see B plus right there when we turn this on. Now it's going to be a reduced B plus because we have the Variac only set to 40 volts, and at that 40 volts couple things that we can tell from this. When I turn the power on, if there's a shorted capacitor or something, this voltage is going to drop pretty substantially. The other thing that we'll notice is this display right here. It's actually lit up bright blue with white lettering, but the filtering in the camera, let me see if I can fix it, here we go, makes it difficult sometimes. Let me see if I can change the filter. There we go. You see that? Let's see if we can zoom in on it. And you can see we only have about 84 milliamps. So when I turn this on, that should stay, that should go up a little bit. We should see the current go up a little bit. And we should see the voltage should not drop a whole lot. So power on. And we dropped just a couple hundred millivolts and if we look under here we have 
only about 165 milliamps, so we're only drawing about 80 milliamps total from the circuit. If we look at, let's see here, if we look at the meter, we have 147 volts on the meter. There we go. And this is all looking really good. So what we're going to do is we're going to let this cook for a little while and gradually increase the variac. And I'm going to kind of reach in every now and then and just kind of touch these caps to see if they're getting warm. Again, I think this one definitely is going to need replaced, but as it looks right now, it's working. Okay, I'm just over 50 volts, and this is going up with it very well. Our current is now up to 200 milliamps. And again, it's going to draw current because the filaments of all the other tubes, except for the outputs, are still in there, so it's still lighting up. Let's keep going up. Isn't this exciting? There's about 65 volts. And our current is 100, 300 milliamps. So everything's climbing as it should. If we see, if, if anything starts to short or, or exhibit any kind of bad leakage, you're going to see the current shoot right up and you're going to see the voltage of the variac will drop a little bit. But I'm not seeing any of that right now. Everything's kind of tracking. So let's go up to, I'm going to go to 90 volts. I'm going to kind of jump ahead. Okay, there's about 90 volts right there. And remember, this thing, when it's operating properly, should be 390 volts, 395 volts. So just under 400 volts there. And it's going to be over 400 volts because we don't have the power tubes in there once we get up to full power. Okay, let's go up to about 110. Okay, there's 110 volts. We are now at 953 milliamps. And like I said, we're clear up to about 400 volts, which is normal. You're, at 110 volts, you're just a little couple volts above uh, where we should be with the tubes out. And if I get up to 120 volts, this is probably going to be closer to like 415 or something like that is what I'm going to guess. Let's go up to 120. And yes, amps from this time did run at like 117. There you go, 430. So it's a little bit hot. And that's normal. It will drop down a good bit when you have the power tubes in there. So for right now, I'm going to turn this back down to 110. And it's happy. So the good news is everything looks good. I don't think there's a bad capacitor immediately, but these caps, after they've been off for a long time, I've seen where they've been powered up like this and they've run for you know an hour or so with no problems and all of a sudden just boom, they short out. So we are going to eventually replace them. In addition, we have the two, uh, those green paper and foil capacitors those have to go as well. Um, I don't think those are film capacitors. I'm almost positive those are paper foil caps. Although later on they were starting to put some film caps in those kinds of cases, but uh, this one's made. These are made by mica mold, and I don't know. Those are probably paper caps. They're going to get replaced with the proper safety capacitors, though, because you don't want those going bad on you because they pop and they splatter pieces of paper and crap all over the inside of your amp. Okay, so, so far so good. We have a good power supply that seems to be working, and if this stays like this for a while and I don't have any problems, then what I'm going to do is we're going to move on with trying to inject a signal into the amplifier section and see what it looks like. Okay, the amplifier is on and I have the meter connected to ground on the black probe and the red probe 
is connected to the B plus number E, which is 320 volts. Now I turned down the variac to get the volt to kind of compensate for the fact that those power tubes are not in there. And we're sitting right around that 320 volts. It just kind of fluctuates around there. And that's good. So now we're going to look at some voltages. What I want to see is during idle, I want to see pin 1 of this tube should be 288 volts roughly. And this is going to be 139.5. So pin 1 and pin 3. And these are rarely ever perfectly on, but depending on the, the, the tube characteristics, both, both sides of that tube. So let's go on to pin 1, which is right here. And let me move the meter around to the side where the camera is able to see. How's that? And we have 292 volts. And we wanted 288. That's really good. I'm happy with that. And then we want our 139.5 on pin 3. And we got 135. So we're within a few, just a few volts. So that means this tube is working properly, and I would have to say that even the stage before it is working properly, or because it's DC coupled, um, and we can look at that. Pin 2 should be somewhere around 138 volts, which is the same as the anode of the other, of the other section. So pin 2, and it's 131. That's not too bad. And then we should have about 1.1 volt on pin 8. So we'll go over here. Pin 8. I think that's right here. And we do. We have 1.05 volts. So that's pretty good. All right. All is looking good so far. Okay, I'm now hooking up both channels so that we can look at this signal here and here, and they should be out of phase. So I'm going to go over to the scope right now. Hope you can see that okay. And I have the two channels you can see separated. And what we should see is two sine waves that are offset by 180 degrees. So turning the signal on, and there we go. See, there's one signal and the other, and you notice they are 180 degrees out of phase, which is exactly what the phase inverter is supposed to do. And you can see as we start to go up in amplitude, and there we go, it's starting to clip. And you can see this is asymmetrical clipping, meaning that one side of the tube is clipping before the other. You can see how it's showing up inverted, but one side is clipping before the other. And quite substantially before, as you notice. The other side can go quite a bit. And that's because they're just not balanced. But you'll see that in tube designs. A lot of times they don't always design this to be perfectly symmetrical. They just design it to get enough drive to drive the output section into full load, into full power. Okay, So that may be more than enough power <laughs> to uh, or enough amplitude to get a clean signal because again if we go way down and you can see it kind of gets wonky looking but if I go way down you can see those look pretty good now here's the problem with how this thing is working number one you have the asymmetrical clipping that probably is happening high enough amplitude that it won't affect the output section, but it might. But more importantly, I have the voltmeter now connected to pin 3, which is the cathode of the, of the tube. So right there you see pin 3, that's the cathode. And if we look at the cathode, it is sitting at 137 volts.
with respect to ground. The black probe is connected to ground. That is a problem, and I'll show you why here in a moment. All right, I have the data sheet here from a 12AX7, which is what, what we're working with right now. And what we're really interested in under the maximum ratings is the heater cathode voltage. Now that is the voltage between the cathode or the filament itself, or the cathode and the filament itself. And you can see that they do not want it to be more than 180 volts difference. And it doesn't matter if it's positive or negative voltage. You can't have more than a 180 volt difference. Now, with this the way it is, we're getting close to that because we're already getting somewhere in the line of what was it saying about 120, 130 volts. And you can see right there. So that's a little bit too close for comfort. And I would really like to see that not exceed 100 volts if possible. Because what this is going to do is this could cause uh, premature wear of the tube. And I have a feeling that these amps would eat output tubes and driver tubes uh, abnormally fast. <laughs> I don't know, but um, that's kind of one of the things. So we're going to try, what can we do to fix this? You know, that's, that's my... That's my goal for this video, what can we do to fix this problem? Alright, so here's our goal for this. First thing I want to do is I want to make sure that the circuit does not exceed a hundred volts differential between the, the filament and the cathode. 145 volts is too much. It's too close to that 180 volt limit. The more we can limit that, the better. Now, there are some things you can do. Uh, one, one possibility would be to, to use what's called elevated heaters. What does that mean? Well, what that means is instead of connecting the filament string to ground to reduce the hum, like you have here, you would take this string and you would connect it to the B plus line or to the voltage line uh, similar to where this is going to be. So you would, if you're going to have 150 volts sitting here for instance, you would float this filament string at 150 volts above ground. So you would disconnect this ground and you would connect 150 volts. That will still reduce the hum, but it will also change that dif difference. The problem is we cannot do that. For instance, if I took, took that heater string right here, where is it again? Took this heater and I, I put it to 150 volt supply. Then what's going to happen is, look, there are other tubes on this string here, I'm sorry, right here. And if I go back to, for instance, the phono stage, we have heaters that are, or cathodes that are tied directly to ground. So now we, we just rearranged the deck furniture on the Titanic once again, didn't we? So this tube will be in spec, but these guys will not be. Same thing with some of these other ones. So this is not, that's not feasible. So really what we need to do is change the bias point of that tube in a manner that it can operate in that safe zone. The other thing is we want to get symmetrical clipping. In order to have symmetrical clipping, you really have to get this tube to operate at the center of its linear region. And a lot of there are a, there's a lot of thought and calculation that goes into that, but really if you're going to have it work properly, that's what we have to do. Um, I want lower distortion of the waveform. Again, if we're working at the center of the linear region of the tube and we make sure that the waveform going into it is not distorted, uh, 
it should clean this up a good bit. And then I want more stability. In other words, we don't want any components uh, to cause a voltage somewhere to drift, which will throw off the bias and throw off the, that stage altogether. So those are our goals. And we're going to try to see if we can make a couple of changes to this that will modify that and help that along. Okay, the first thing we're going to do here is, I'll zoom you in for a moment, and if you look, I lifted that leg of that resistor there. And what that is, is that's that 150 ohm bypass resistor uh, that creates that current divider in there. So we're going to see what happens to this tube. Now, if, if it goes really crazy, I'm going to shut the power off really quickly so we don't damage the tube, but let's turn it on and see what happens. And again, we don't want this to exceed 180 volts. And it does not look like it's going to. Actually, it's a little bit lower. Well, that's good. So now, let's see what happens when we apply a signal. And there's your problem. <laughs> it does not work. Okay, so you can't just remove the uh, that resistor. It needs to be in there. Because what's happening now is by not having that current divider, it it's throwing the bias of that circuit off, and you're going to have to do something to the rest of the circuit to balance that out. So um, that's what we're going to do. We're going to see what we can change to make it better. OK, the modification on this channel is done, which is the left channel, even though it's on the right because the amp's flipped upside down. But we're going to start out with the unmodified channel. So what we want to do here is I have the oscilloscope connected to the two outputs of the cathodyne. So we're looking here and here. And we're going to look at, we're going to put a 300 millivolt RMS signal in here, and we're going to look at what comes out here. Now remember, you need somewhere around 20 to 25 volts peak, peak to peak, or no, peak. <laughs> Uh, to get enough drive voltage to drive a 7591. So that's our goal is to get somewhere around there and get it to be clean. And remember, even though the right here is your feedback resistor coming from the output transformer, we don't have the output tubes fitted. So really all this is doing is this is going in parallel with your resistor here and feeding through this coil, which is very, very low resistance to ground. So all you're doing is you're shunting this 3.9K resistor plus a couple of ohms here uh, in parallel with this 220 right here. You won't get any effective negative feedback until you actually have the output tubes fitted so that there will be a signal. So just keep that in mind. And that feedback will actually improve the signal a lot. OK, here's our oscilloscope. And uh, I'll get you zoomed in. And let's take a look at what this signal looks like with 300 millivolts RMS driving it. And you can see it's pretty ugly. Uh, one side of each peak is decent, which is probably these are the peaks that you're actually using. but these ones here, you can see, are already starting to distort. 
I'm at 20 volts per division so you can see I have 20, 40, almost 50 volts uh, right there, about 45 volts peak to peak, which that should be enough signal to drive full power into those 7591 tubes. But I think we can all agree that's a pretty wonky looking signal. It's not, it probably would be cleaned up with the feedback, but number one, it's distorting before you get enough drive. By the time you put the negative feedback in here, that's going to clean it up, but it's also going to shrink it. So that's the problem with this amp is you can't get enough drive into the output tubes to properly drive them to their full power with, without distorting. All right, let's look at our modified channel now. Okay, we're now connected to the other channel. Same signal, same signal amplitude, same conditions. Let's go back over to our scope. And let's see what happens. Hopefully this will look better, huh? All right, here goes nothing. And you can see that's a lot more consistent. Uh, you can see the tiniest little bit of rounding compared to this side, but you really, really, really have to look to see it. And the nice thing is, before it begins to look like the other channel, which is right there, you can see this channel still holding its own pretty good. This one is starting to distort a little bit, or this side. So there is a little bit of asymmetrical distortion, but not terrible. But now I'm driving 400 millivolts instead of 300, and I'm getting a lot more amplitude now. Now I'm getting 20, 40, 60, 70 volts peak to peak. And by the time you get the negative feedback signal going into there, that's going to clean the rest of this right up. So, And we can put a good amount of feedback on it now because we, we have extra drive voltage to spare. And that's the reason that I wanted to make this modification. Now we could also bypass this cathode resistor of the first stage there with a capacitor. And that would also uh, increase the gain a little bit more. And you'd still get the distortion, but again, you would have a higher, uh, little bit higher gain. I don't think it's necessary. There's more than enough power there um, or gain in the circuit as it is. So I'm going to leave it alone. If we need it, though, we can add it. And just for the sake of completeness, we're looking at the cathode now with respect to ground, which is going to tell us our cathode to filament voltage difference. And if I turn the power on, you can see it starts out at 51 volts. And when the tube starts to conduct, I'll show you real quick. It's going to go up. And then it's going to settle. And it's going to stay under 80 volts now. Much better than the 140 volts that it was at before. So we have achieved all of our goals in uh, this design. Well, we've come to the end of this episode, and I think what I decided I want to do is when I do this modification to this channel, we'll do another solder and talk session. So I'll just do one little standalone video of just doing all this so you can kind of watch how I clean off these terminals and some things like that, and we can talk while we do that because a lot of you seem to enjoy that, and I enjoy it too because I get the most comments I get from all of you is when I do that, believe it or not. I can do this big, fancy, elaborate video on something, but when I just sit down and randomly talk while I'm working, I get more comments from all of you, which is cool. That's, that's my payment for this, really. That's the part that I like. So anyway, we're going to leave it at that. 
Uh, just so you know, I did measure a lot of these carbon comp resistors in through here. Some of them were spot on, and I mean perfect. Some of them were way out, they had drifted, and that's what carbon resistors do. So I think it's a good thing that we're replacing some of this. And you, as you notice, a few of the original ones that are perfect, and the higher, these higher quality ones up here, uh, I left them as is, there's no need to replace them. Same thing with these coupling caps. They're good caps, they work, they're fine, they're staying in. So until next time, I wish you all peace, joy, happiness, and good health in your lives. And I'm really excited to get this other channel done, make sure they match, and then uh, get on with the business of setting up the outputs. That's for future videos. Till then, take care and stay well. Bye-bye.